mark on the 20th century. Louis Le Brocchi. As you see, what I've been doing is a kind of trial and error. It is a matter of, of uh, attempting to produce marks which, in their turn, can suggest a further course. Whether these marks I've just put on now stay there is unlikely. I shall probably now take them all out and start again. If the whole image does not emerge in a satisfactory way and, as it were, surprise me, then at that stage I should destroy it. I must be surprised by the work. That is to say, without surprise, it is meaningless to me. Eventually, some kind of image emerges, which is something which appears to me to be outside myself something from which I can learn. I had no idea of becoming a painter when I left school and worked as a chemist in my grandfather's oil refinery in Dublin. My paternal grandfather, whose name I bear, was born in Brussels of a family seemingly of Breton origin. During World War I, he was the first honorary Belgian consul in Ireland. I went to the then strictly boys' school near Bray in Wicklow, St. Gerard's. Art was not taught there. But one of my teachers, who is a nephew of the author of Alice in Wonderland, Lewis Carroll, took it into his head that I was an artist and encouraged me in that direction. Well, I did some watercolours. They weren't very satisfactory to me because I was attempting really to paint, as it were, in the adult style. And it was something which was tiresome and, 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 and the cleverer I became at it, the more disgusted I became with myself. I also did one or two light-hearted caricatures of various masters there. One I remember was a master called Mr. Rideout, or Ridout, I think was his name. And I did a caricature of him which amused some of my fellow pupils. After leaving school, I drifted into my Belgian grandfather's oil refinery in Harold's Cross while studying chemistry at Trinity College, a marvelous expansion to my early life. Sometime before I decided to become a painter, I did make two experimental works, later entered in the Royal Hibernian Academy exhibitions of 1937 and 1938. One of these was an attempted image of Debussy's L'Après-Midi d'un Fonde. I've always been interested in music and at times passionate about it. Debussy's L'Après-Midi d'un Fon was one of the most moving pieces to me. I think it reflected some kind of naturalism, a kind of impressionism as Debussy felt it was, which moved me very much. The painting, I don't think, is a very satisfactory painting myself. As a dreamy illustration of this work, it meant something to me at the time. 
During the summer of 1938, I haunted our National Gallery, where I was greatly impressed by the power of El Greco St. Francis receiving the stigmata. This unique painting was for me an experience as I think it must have been originally to this great esoteric painter. For the painting of those clouds alone is autonomous. They are a form not of clouds, but of ectoplasm underlying the elongated ecstasy of St. Francis. My mother was a very remarkable woman. She had an immense influence on my life, and she occupied herself with all kinds of cultural and social concerns. The position was that my grandfather was counting on me, shall I say, as well as my, on my brother, to enter into the, into the company which he had founded, the Greenmount Oil Company in Harold's Cross in Dublin. And uh, any, any attempt to pull out and become something else or take up another would be regarded as a form of betrayal. So my mother had to organize it in such a way that I simply disappeared. She did not tell my father because she was afraid that he would get into trouble with his father, who was an extremely dominant character, so I disappeared secretly. When I first came to Monton, I lived in the very, very top of a block of flats in Monton, in a tiny place, tiniest space I've ever been to see. I was very struck by various aspects, the great flower market, the great vegetable market, all of these things were staggering to me. I'd never seen anything like them in Dublin. And indeed, even the trees, the orange trees that lined the streets, these were things that influenced me immensely. I painted Southern Window in Monton. One thing which attracted me very much to painting Southern Window was the sense of the individual being alone in this room, in her own world, cut off from things, and in her ultimate state of aloneness. Something which has crept into a lot of my work subsequently. I have always admired Manet and still do. I regard him as being a genuinely historic figure in line with Titian, with all the great, all the great Spaniards, and uh, with whom he was, of course, very much influenced. In particular, the very early southern window, where even the green shutters, the green shutters of Le Balcon, are repeated in southern window. He's been always something of a god to me, Anne, Edouard Anne. When war broke out, having been assured that I would not be forced back into the business, we consented to come back. And we came back eventually in 1940 through London to Dublin. When I returned from France with my first wife, Jean Stoney, we managed 
to rent the top flat of number 16 Upper Fitzwilliam Street. It was my first real studio, thanks to our very good landlady, Mrs. Daly, who allowed me to make a large skylight in her roof. I painted a number of works there, including A Picnic and Girl in White. When I painted A Picnic, I was still learning to paint. I did the final work on mounted canvas, which work is based really on uh, Degas' uh, Sur la Plage in the Lane collection. The model in Girl in White was Kathleen Ryan, who later became something of a film star. It is based to some extent in my mind and influenced by the Japanese pillar print, pillar prints of Utamaro, Kiyonaga, and the like. It is, in fact, in that sense, a very formal painting. We were thrown back on ourselves during the war. At this time, I used to visit Jack Yates regularly in his drawing room studio in Fitzwilliam Square, and sometimes saw that rose fixed to the easel. He would show me his paintings one by one, having carefully placed each canvas in a glazed frame. He was always kind and helpful. I still remember him telling me, pay no attention to adverse criticism. The true artist has vision, the critic has only an opinion. Many Gillette and Evie Hole were back, of course, from the continent already and brought with them their invaluable interpretation of contemporary art, of modern art in those days. They were, they were indispensable to us, greatly admired by us all, and uh, they had a tremendous effect on art of this time. Not that very many of us actually used their particular vision, but they, but they were, they were, uh, they showed a sense of release from academic values, which was indispensable for, to us. In 1943, the Exhibition of Living Art, the Irish Exhibition of Living Art, was opened. The Royal Iberian Academy had refused the uh, painting I did called Spanish Shawl, and this painting was refused along with others which I sent in. And uh, at that time, of course, many Jellet, Evie Hone, and others were also expelled. There's no questions they're showing their work in the academy. And so my mother arranged with Manny to become the first president of Living Art. There was no question of giving reasons, but quite clearly it was judged to be way out in some way, though it's very difficult to see that nowadays, because it's just what you might describe as really mildly impressionistic or something of that nature. It did not come as any surprise to me, because in those days art was really, uh, painting anyway, was not appreciated really at all, very, very little. And, uh, and even Jack Yates in those days, I can remember people mocking him and mocking his shows. I used to have all kinds of conversations and in interviews indeed with people like Sean Keating, who were naturally enough and perhaps very properly very fearful and resentful of my kind of painting. After the breakup of my brief first marriage in 1941, I moved into a really good studio at 13 Marion Row, which had once belonged to Paul Henry. It became the doorstep to a seasonal world through which I could wander.
when I painted famine cottages in Connemara, I was moved by the apparent presence of that humanity which had left it. It was a haunted place. Condemned Man is a rather grey painting and does seem to anticipate her family some six years later. Even to the electric light bulb in its tin shade. When I made this painting in 1945, it was as a reflection on prison conditions in general and capital punishment in particular. As I remember, the prisoner in the painting is seen through a darkened window, although his cell within is lit by an electric bulb. The cat on the move between the bars was, I suppose, an image of freedom. As is the minute figure on the horizon. About 1945, I was uh, in the Midlands, in the Tullamore area, and uh, there I came across some tinkers. Tinsmiths. They had their colorful caravans. I was fascinated by them. During this period, I used to paint these people, and I also painted some of their mysteries. For instance, they had this way of making what they called twig signs on the side of the road in which they would cross twigs in certain ways. And this would be a series of signs not only of a very practical nature, where they would be told that there were hens up the road, the boring up this side, and whatever, but also various mysterious signs which the people in the countryside got to know about. Various journalists, critics, art galleries arrived from London and New York. Among these was Charles Gampel, who had become my constant friend and supporter. A marvellously enlightened leader in the London art world of the 40s and 50s. In 1946, with the gallery just set up in London, my father had been recuperating from uh, his experiences in concentration camp in Germany during the war. He'd been captured as a French resistance fighter. And my mother uh, took him to Ireland, where she had relatives in Westmeath. And, my f and she nursed him back to health there. He got his strength back over many months. And while he was there, he was paying visits to Dublin. And that's when he first came across Louis' work. Without hesitation, I turned to him and headed for London. My first work in London, Travelling Woman with Newspaper, was painted in a badly lit bedsit in York Street, Marabon. I remember that it was fiercely cold that winter in 1946 to 47 made worse by post-war rationing and my little gas fire switching off automatically at intervals. Without adequate daylight or heat, I painted in an overcoat and fingerless woolen gloves by electric light late into the night. The British Council did exhibit the work in 1949 at Amsterdam and 
following that a number of other European capitals. That was also the time that the Tate bought the first of my works, Travellers Resting. creating bird, I remember vaguely having in mind the puppet Petrushka, who becomes human in Stravinsky's great ballet. But in this painting, it is the puppet man who is creating life. An unconscious forecast of the ominous genetic experiments of half a century later. Council of Great Britain commissioned me along with Stanley Spencer and Graham Sutherland to design my first tapestry. I chose the theme of traveling people in line with my paintings at that time. It opened up for me a new world of possibility. Tapestry design is a severe discipline, but so different from painting as to become something of a relaxation with the added excitement of color. Garlanded goat evolved from a stimulating, if exhausting, visit to the three-day puck fair in Kilorglan, County Kerry. When you saw the tapestry, which these numbers of workers have been working on for long, long periods, when you saw it rolled off before you, it was a surprise. It's the same surprise as a Sosuma, a Japanese Sosuma potter might expect when he took a piece out of the oven. It was something which was, uh, had unexpected elements in it and was, in that sense, a revelation. Ooh, ah. A family was painted in 50-51. I started in 50, I remember. It was rejected then by the municipal gallery, I remember, and I was very disappointed, of course. One of the principal people who was instrumental in its rejection on the grounds of incompetence and of being offensive was Sean Keating. I understood Sean Keating's concern at that time, that he could perceive this painting as a real threat to his own academic values. The elements in his composition correspond in some ways to those of Olympia, if not to Manny's cool sensuality. The female figure in a family may be seen to take on a very different significance. The man, replacing Manet's black servant with Bouquet, sits alone. The Bouquet is reduced to a mere wisp held by a child. The Olympian black cat in turn becomes white. ominously emerging from the sheets. This is how a family appears to me today. Fifty years ago, it was painted while contemplating a human condition stripped back to Paleolithic circumstance under naked electric light bulbs.
painting, which was a very famous painting, had hung in the Nestle collection of Milan since 55, I think. They had been asked to sell it many times, but had refused. And then all of a sudden we learned that some Italian dealer had bought their whole collection in Milan, including this painting. Being an Irish painting, it was put to the London market. And at that stage, a London dealer got the commission to sell the painting. So that's where it came from. A London dealer offered me the painting. It's clearly um, one of the great masterpieces that Louis has painted. Um, the best of anything is very hard to determine, but it's one of the great paintings, no question. Throughout the 1950s, art became abstract, abstract de rigueur. In London, painters such as Francis Bacon, Lucian Freud, and indeed myself, were not considered to be significantly contemporary. Thus, in 1953, I was able to buy myself a very large Bacon study for a portrait for as little as 200 pounds. I lived with this great painting for many years. I met Francis himself in 1954. I've always regarded him as one of the great painters of our time. Francis never missed a London exhibition of my work, and his constant support during his lifetime meant a great deal to me. The 1950s and 60s in America in particular, in New York in particular, were extremely restrictive stylistically. There was a school of criticism which uh, for all practical purposes maintained that either you are an ex abstract expressionist or you are no good. I mean, it was simplified to this absurdity. And uh, he and a few others, of course, were exempting themselves from this. I mean, I'm thinking of Jean Dubuffet in uh, Europe. I'm thinking of Willem de Kooning in America. I'm thinking of Francis Bacon uh, in England. Uh, these were artists who uh, uh, just wouldn't buy that and who went counter-current. And uh, so did uh, Louis Le Broquet, and I respected the courage that it took to do this, as well as the distinction of the result. In 1952, I moved into number three Albert Studios, one of a row of eight classified studio dwellings in Battersea, where I painted such works as Child in a Dark Room, Tired Child, the initial version of Children in a Wood, and Lazarus. A family illness is not based on any one incident, such as the stroke my father suffered. I see it rather as a graphic expression of the care, concern and anxiety brought on within the family by the presence of serious illness. I see this small painting as an image not of loneliness, but of aloneness, of being without others. What was my motivation in painting this? Well, consciously this was an attempt to make some kind of image of our ultimate condition of aloneness. Child in the Yard is a much larger painting than Child in a Dark Room. It is based on much the same theme in broad daylight, but with darkness implied. The first Children in a Wood of 1954 
was constructed in much the same manner as a family two years earlier. In both, I limited myself to a rather severe cubistic fracture. All of these paintings envisaged the same kind of circumstance. It was, if I could put it this way, a kind of Paleolithic circumstance where a man was reduced back, paired back, to his fundamentals, usually shown naked. And this was done necessarily under modern conditions. So the modern conditions were, were again stripped back to bare walls, naked electric light bulbs and the like. Painting this tiny image of Caroline, a Downs syndrome child, somewhere in the mid-50s, was a moving moment in my life. Caroline was the five-year-old daughter of an architect who approached me out of the blue, asking me to paint her. I was so afraid of offending Caroline's devoted father that I included the finished work in my exhibition that year, thinking that if the father did like it, he could simply buy it off the wall. As it turned out, the painting was bought at the exhibition by the poet Stephen Spender. In 1955, I made an extensive tour of Spain. I was commissioned to make a whole series of textile designs from my experience there. One day, while passing through a village in La Mancha, in shimmering heat, I stopped spellbound before a small group of women and children standing against a whitewashed wall. Here, the intensity of the sunlight had interposed its own revelation, absorbing these human figures into its brilliance, giving substance only to their shadows. From that moment, I never perceived the human presence in quite the same way. I had witnessed light as a kind of matrix from which the human being emerges and into which, ambivalently, it eventually recedes. Whiteness had entered as well, an entire period or an entire series of works at that time of these works which were called presences. White has always been a dominant factor in my work. I think possibly because of its, you could say, purity, but I would even prefer to, to regard it as being a transcendental color. When I first met Louis, I was very struck by his appearance, his allure. But as well as that, I was struck by his physical presence, which emanated something I found beautiful. It was at Alba Studios I met the young painter Anne Madden, with whose beauty and with whose passionate spirit I fell irrevocably in love. Before I knew Anne, she had a very serious writing accident, displacing several vertebrae. When we met in 1956, she had to face another spinal operation, the first having failed to stabilize. Faced with this new assault, this terrible carpentry on her spine, I felt overcome by a kind of impotent rage. I think it was that 
which caused me to emphasize the spinal element in the painting and also even a touch of red at the top of the spine in young woman young woman Anne her body which I loved and, 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 and desired inflicted in this way we sought the warm climate of the Mediterranean on the advice of the surgeons who had operated on my spine. We made our way south, first to the bar and then to the Alp Maritime when we found Les Combes in the foothills uh, of the Alp Maritime behind Nice. This gave us the en most enormous expansion to our lives. It was a Garden of Eden. It had two houses, the main house, which is not as large as it appeared on the outside because it was very shallow, but it was a wonderful place. And as well as that, it had this superb studio designed by our great friend, Ronnie Tallon. In this superb space, we both worked happily for some 38 years. He's a hedonist in many ways, Louis. And we were always many round the great table on the terrace outside the house and at lunchtime and in the evenings. And remember, peonies and the wild irises and the lemons and the oranges grown on our trees that all appear in his work. The sheer luminosity of the south of France was a help and even an incentive to work. But the work itself largely followed its own interior course, I think. Isolated being, it is one of the very first paintings I painted in Les Combes in the south of France. I had been painting these presence paintings and this was simply a variation of them. It belonged to that particular period, to that particular uh, obsession at the time. When the series of present paintings came to an end in 1963, I entered a blind year, a year in which no significant image emerged. I was in despair. Then Anne proposed we might go to Paris, where I discovered in the Musée de l'Homme the decorated ancestral heads of Polynesia. Magic objects, which inspired a long series of head images rising, as did the preceding presence paintings, from amorphous backgrounds. But now, reaching towards the interiorized being in the more personalized form of the head. In Celtic sagas, severed heads were known to speak and even sing. Such was the strange culture that inspired Hommage à Entremont. These heads were in a new context after this discovery I made in Paris. In this new context, they were in a sense a continuum of my previous preoccupation in the presence paintings. It was always a reaching towards the reality of this inner being, which we all know to exist within ourselves, but which is invisible, intangible, impalpable, and possibly not very easily realized in the very palpable means of paint on canvas. Nonetheless, my fascination continued and I continued to try reaching towards it, reaching towards this thing which we know to exist and which at the same time is unrealizable. 
I was still painting these personalized heads when I was commissioned to make an aquatint to celebrate an Irish Nobel Prize winner. At that time, just 33 countries had Nobel Prize winners, and from each was selected an artist to honor his national laureate. I chose W.B. Yeats, if only because I had known him when I was a boy. My mother in particular was very involved with drama and literature in Dublin. She was very much a friend of Yeats and of George, his wife. He was indeed a very impressive presence. Rather awe-inspiring, in fact. Another long series followed of literary artists whom I think of as extraordinary instances of human consciousness, including images of James Joyce and of Samuel Beckett. Sam Beckett was a dear friend of Anne Madden and myself for many years during which I painted a continuous series of images of his head in oils and in watercolour. At his request, I designed the set and costumes for Godot, including the somewhat cruciform tree, which I conceived while guided by his own indications, which he himself sketched roughly for me. Saying, not more than two branches. What you get in, in Le Brocchi's heads are signals of, of the weight of the world. They, uh, they are images, they're beautifully painted, faceted, richly turned in every way. But what they turn out to be and turn into are witnesses of the, the weight of experience. And Le Brocchi isn't a, an autobiographical painter. He, he does lose ego, he, but what comes forward in those paintings is, is a, a grave consciousness of, uh, of reality. I think Le Brocchi's heads, uh, in terms of their physical uh, painting on canvas, have something of the Veronica, have something of the, the head of the suffering Christ imprinted there. But, but they also have this archetypal head worship, sculpted head, Celtic head element to them. suddenly saw heads uh, which, uh, on the one hand, were recognizable as such, and on the other hand, clearly went beyond it. Uh, there was something uh, that uh, was simultaneously external and internal. Uh, you had a sense of uh, great depth from which uh, this image was emerging. <laughs> Um, at first glance, I was thinking about expressionism, but I revised my thinking about this because it was not so much an expression as perhaps an emergence out of 
the white background. I think it was in 1968 when I was living in France that that highly imaginative publisher and designer, Liam Miller, asked me to illustrate Thomas Kinsler's great translation of what Kinsler himself described as Ireland's nearest approach to a great epic, the Torn O'Quilla. In this work, I found myself linked with Tom in his inspired effort to breathe new life into this race memory. Since 1969, these lithographic brush drawings continue to illustrate continuous editions and reprints of Kinsler's toyme in English, German, French and Spanish. to have made a set of images as characteristic of himself as the early Jack Yates's graphic work was, was characteristic of him. Whatever happened on the pages of the Dunman Press Town, they were, as he called them, I think he called them Marks and Printers Inc. But they marked the eye, the sheer simplicity, joy, authority. I had great difficulty in trying to decide how to illustrate some, uh, a legend which is first of all so much embedded in the whole Irish psyche and which uh, at the same time was something which I would not wish to impose myself or my views as to what they were wearing, how they behaved or anything of that kind. So I was very puzzled for a long time as to how I could possibly manage to illustrate such a legend without describing in some, in some way. And description would be an impertinence from my point of view. He was insistent all the time of the exactitude of which each, each drawing, the drawing was so important mm. to... And so eventually I turned to Oriental, Japanese, and Chinese calligraphy as being a spontaneous manner of achieving movement without description. I had to then try to find a way by which I would use this form of calligraphy to describe not merely words, but images. I saw recently a, 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 an exhibition of Louis de Burkis of, of these processions. And I have to say, when he brought together different paintings of the procession theme, they're large, they're generous, they're unstinted in their joy. Uh, I seem to be always thinking of, of phrases from poets to describe uh, what's going on in the paintings, but poet Robert Lowell had a wonderful phrase to describe sheer physical delight. They talked about the body's thousand rivulets of joy. And when you look at uh, the, these procession paintings, when I've looked at them recently, there's a, a you know, a, an, there's an uncensored element of delight in them, both in, in his use of the paint and in his permission to us as viewers to, to go with it. There's rivulets of joy all over the place. In the 80s and 90s, I thought I would try to realize the two procession themes, children in a wood and procession with lilies, with a more crystalline structure in which the texture of flesh and garments might be more sensitively realized. In both of these two procession themes, I myself tended to see the group not as a crowd, but as a succession of individual beings within what Joyce has described as a succession of present moments.
I was commissioned by the National Gallery to make this work. And it was quite a challenge because it was an immensely large tapestry of immense height. Also, the architects asked me if I would do something which was colorful. So I taught up this idea of making, as it were, a rainbow of garlands, gruesome heads. In that sense, it was an effort to reach back from our rather socially orientated civilization today to something of ineffable violence, but which at the same time was something we had in fact evolved from. Although I was living in France, I always maintained a link with London. Paris and London remained the centers where I most needed my work to be judged. Tapestries at Agnews and human images at Gampel. I always enjoy being back in London, in the London art world again. A painter's favorite work, I think, is usually his most recent. That is what excites him most and drives him forward. This is where all his previous work has led. Laterally, I have returned to the present series of torsos in an attempt to reach further towards some kind of image of the inner being. I call these last paintings human images. He could have stopped at various points in his career and said, I'm happy with this, but he never has. He's taken risks, and I admire him no end for, for being able to do this, and I expect him to go on taking risks because it's in the nature of the person that he's always curious about what he can achieve. I've known Bono for almost 20 years now painting a number of such interiorized images of him, a number of them during that time. But a recognizable portrait commissioned by the National Gallery was another matter. I hesitated, then accepted, attempting somehow to fuse an overt likeness into my deeper feelings when observing the almost physical radiation of Bono's intense energy. So this is the this is the area there, one area of, as it were, feeling. Pierre's extraordinary insight in regard to my art, his belief in its significance, and his continuous support springing from that belief, is the most imaginative help I have known in my entire working life. It's wonderful. Mm. It's very beautiful. I think that his powers of concentration are fueled by a certain stillness and patience, which have served his constant contemplation of the nature of the human spirit, an abiding factor in his entire earth. When I first saw it, I was rem reminded of a, uh, of a quote by Goethe, uh, who uh, said, uh, I'll do it in German first, uh, nichts ist innen, nichts ist außen, was ist drinnen, das ist draußen. Uh, uh, meaning to say that uh, nothing is exclusively within or without. What's inside is outside. You know, there, there are these relationships that are essentially uh, interrelated to a point of being identical. In 
initially, I simply wanted to become a good painter, to join in the spiritual excitement of a great creative tradition. I have come to think that painting, the act of painting, 